I'll, I'll speak slowly, you know, to try to give everybody else who hasn't joined this yet uh, a chance to join. Um, shalom, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Daniel Corin. I'm the Executive Director of Hasbro Fellowships Canada. And I would like to thank all of you for joining us here today for the security briefing on Israel, America, and the Iranian threat with uh, Mr. Yaakov Katz, Editor-in-Chief of the Jerusalem Post. Yaakov, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. I, uh, <laughs> uh, I would like to thank, obviously, all of you who are here today. And uh, you know, for all our, our students here today, happy to see you. For all our uh, wonderful community members and supporters, Thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting our mission to train and empower student leaders to combat anti-Semitism on campuses from across North America. Uh, these students, many of whom are here with us today, serve as advocates on campus, not just for Israel, but for peace and for coexistence for Israelis and Palestinians alike. And I think despite so many challenges that they have faced on campus recently, uh, these students are more emboldened than ever to educate and enlighten those around them about Zionism, Judaism, about the Arab-Israeli conflict, and uh, from a very balanced perspective. And I think balance is something that's very much missing today and on social media especially. So I, I, I think that's a wonderful thing our students are able to do. Um, I'd like to take this moment now to introduce Mr. Katz, who is, the, as I said, the editor-in-chief of Jerusalem Post, uh, previously served uh, for close to a decade as uh, Jerusalem Post's military reporter. Uh, he's the author of Shadow Strike, Inside Israel's Secret Mission to Eliminate Syrian Nuclear Power, and uh, the co-author of two books, Weapon Wizards, How Israel Became a High-Tech Military Superpower, and uh, Israel versus Iran, The Shadow War. Uh, in 2012 to 2013, Mr. Katz was a fellow at the Nearman Foundation for Journalism at Harvard University, and was a faculty member at Harvard's Extension School, where he taught an advanced course in journalism. I will say again, Mr. Katz, thank you, Yaakov. We are so happy to have you. Um, I, I think I can go right into it. Please. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so I think most of us might know that uh, Yair Lapid was just recently on a three-day trip to Washington uh, to discuss the Iranian threat, uh, which was also the primary agenda item for Prime Minister Naftali Benefit when he was recently in Washington. Uh, to, to your knowledge, what was discussed, uh, you know, pertaining to these issues? And does it appear that the White House and the Israeli government are close to being on the same page here? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Sorry, Daniel. Uh, first of all, great to be with you all. Uh, Hasbara, I think I've known you guys probably now for 15 years. And you do incredible work in uh, training students and giving them the tools to create what you said, Daniel, which is really the most difficult and complex uh, maybe thing in, in, in this whole discourse about Israel and the world and the Palestinians and Iran and, and BDS, which is balance, right? And context. Um, and I know this from the job that I do, as you can see, I'm, I'm in my office right now, going through pages for tomorrow's newspaper. Um, nice. So, uh, you know, context and balance is uh, is always complicated when, when we're talking about issues that are so uh, heated, emotional, and, and, and get people so passionate, right? Um, take Sally Rooney as an example, right? This uh, author this week, this Irish author, very famous, I had not heard of her, I'm, I'll be honest. I'll, yeah, I'll me admit, neither. I had never heard of her. Um, but uh, who, who decided to make her claim to fame with saying that I'm not willing to have my books translated by an Israeli publisher, which was, you know, it turns out her books are published in Russian, her books are published in, in, in China. It's like Ben Cohen from Ben and Jerry's, who was asked on that Axios video, right, which I'm sure many of you saw, you know, but what about the state of Texas or the state of Georgia with voting rights and abortion? And he sits there silent thinking, what do I do? You know, <laughs> well, uh, and, and his answer is, well, that's a good question. And I don't have an answer, right? You know, th this, 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 all they have is this magnet that draws them to Israel because we are an easy target, because it's popular, it's woke, it's, it's exciting. Maybe it gets you some friends, maybe it's cool, I don't know. But, uh, but I think that all of us who are here know the truth and know how complicated these 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 issues really are and uh 
and, and I commend you guys, Daniel and Ellie and Robin and all the other top members of, uh, of Hasbara's great staff for, for the fantastic work that you do. So with Thank that, so uh, talking about Lapid. So, uh, so yes, the Iron Lapid went to Washington um, for a meeting with uh, uh, Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State. He also met with uh, Abdallah, Sheikh Abdallah, who's the uh, Bin Zayed, who's the uh, uh, UAE foreign minister. He had meetings with Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, and with um, Kamala Harris, the Vice President, and other members of the administration and the and Congress. The purpose of the meeting, I would say, was probably twofold. On the one hand, Iran is really coming to a decision or a critical moment in time in what the administration will do and whether the Iranians are going to return to a nuclear deal, whether the nuclear deal will be any different than the 2015, what was known as the JCPOA, or, and, uh, or if they won't, and if they don't come back to the deal, or there isn't a better deal that's put in place, what happens next, right? And that's the big question I think everyone wants to know is what's plan B? Uh, Israel has some ideas of what plan B should be. The Americans have different ideas of what plan B should be. And I think that what Israel is trying to do right now is really align itself and get America on the same page so that if the deal does not happen, and it's not a better deal, what, what does happen next? We could talk a moment about that. At the same time, there's another big issue, which I actually just wrote a piece about that'll appear in tomorrow's paper. We'll go online a bit later this evening. Uh, this is the Jerusalem Council, right? This is a big problem for Israel. And I think that a lot of people don't necessarily understand or, or have fully internalized how big an issue this is. But uh, the administration has basically said that they intend to open a U.S. council, it's in Jerusalem, to serve the dedicated to the Palestinians. Now, the reason this is a problem is because there's an embassy now in Jerusalem that is for the United States. The U.S. has an embassy, right? That was opened back in, in 2018. And uh, for the administration to now decide to open a council, first of all, it's unheard of, right? You don't have an embassy in, your, in a city that is a capital of another country and a consulate that serves another entity, right? It just doesn't exist anywhere in the world. But it also undermines the... Uh, the, the recognition that Israel received from the United States and having Jerusalem as its capital. Now, this is complicated for a number of reasons. One is that it undermines the coalition in Israel. There are members of this coalition, as we all know, I call it the kaleidoscope coalition, right? Because it has members of the right, members of the left, it has an Arab party. Uh, it's got across the board, it's a, it's a beautiful idea on paper. It's very complicated to practically work with. But there are members of this coalition from the right wing flank who openly are saying that if this happens, they might not stay in this government, right? Because remember, the government would have to give some sort of approval to the United States to open this consulate in Jerusalem. Um, so this has the, the, the potential to bring down the coalition. So there's a lot of people in the coalition, including the prime minister, including the foreign minister, who are very concerned about this possibility. Um, I don't know if they're able to convince the administration. We saw yesterday, Secretary of State Blinken made a comment that uh, the, they're moving forward with steps to uh, open the consulate for, and, and the reason he said was we wanted to deepen ties with the Palestinians. I would argue that not only will this not deepen ties with the Palestinians, this will just deepen the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, because what this will do is forget about undermining Israel's connection to Jerusalem. We don't need someone to tell us whether it's our capital or not. It's been our capital for 3,000 years. But, uh, but, but what it will do is create another falsehood, right? And, and, and the problem is that all these decades that the Americans and the Europeans gave support and backing to Palestinian claims to have a place in Jerusalem, to have a right of return, to see a complete Israeli withdrawal from to pre-67 lines, what that did was it created a, a unrealistic expectations and a falsehood of that this will actually happen one day when, when it won't and it wouldn't. And instead we got decades of intransigence by the Palestinians and refusal by the Palestinians to ever accept a deal that was more practical and more realistic. So to again do this is to again extend and deepen the conflict, not deepen ties with the Palestinians. It's, it's, so, but back to your question, 
Lapid and Bennett are trying to convince the administration that this is a bad idea, right? They're using different reasons. One of them is that it'll endanger the uh, survival of the coalition. You might get Bibi back, right? The Nebocrats don't want Netanyahu coming back. Um, it could open the door for other governments and other uh, countries to also demand to have a consulate for the Palestinians in, in Jerusalem. And while those are maybe important technical excuses, as we know in life, technical problems have technical solutions. There is a deeper problem, which is more fundamental, which I spoke about before, what this would potentially do. So they're trying to talk to the Americans about that. But really, I would say the bigger issue is definitely Iran, right? We know <clears throat> that the Iranians. And this is a problem that uh, you know does kind of date back to 2018 when Trump pulled out of the JCPOA. What the Americans said they wanted to do back then was they wanted to get the Iranians to come back and negotiate a better deal. I remember I had an opportunity uh, in the summer of 2018 to meet with uh, uh, Secretary of State um, Pompeo, right. and uh, and and we were sitting in his office at the State Department, and he's got this big, long conference table. And I said to him, so Secretary Pompeo, when are the Iranians going to come and sit at that table and negotiate a better deal? And he said, look, if, if, we, uh, if we stay in power, they'll come, right? Eventually, they'll know they'll have to come. They're not going to come till our term is up, because they're going to hold out and hope that you know some Democrat, whoever it'll be, will take over. But if we win in 2020, then they will come back. Well, that didn't happen. And that strategy didn't work out. So instead of doing something else, nothing really happened. It was a waiting game. The Iranians saw it as an opportunity to also uh, violate the deal. And they've enriched uranium to larger quantities and to greater and higher enrichment levels. They now are, are just a jump away, really, from having enough enriched uranium at a military grade level, which is over 90%. They have a significant quantity already over 60%. They have a lot over 20%. But if they take everything that they have and spin it through their centrifuges, uh, which they have thousands that are operating right now, they, they could have within just a several weeks, maybe a month, uh, enough for at least one nuclear device. Now, that doesn't mean they have a nuclear weapon, right? That means they have enough enriched material to one day develop a nuclear weapon, a nuclear weapon would probably take another two years because, you know, just not to get too technical, but you'd have to take the gas, turn it into metal, then you'd have to create a warhead, or then, I'm sorry, then you'd have to create a bomb, then you'd have to install it in a warhead on a ballistic missile that will be able to fly to Israel and detonate over Israel somewhere to disperse and to, and to cause its devastation. So uh, that's extremely complicated and estimates are that that's still a couple of years away, but if they did enrich uranium to military grade level, I'll tell you what I'm hearing from senior Israeli officials in the military and the government, that that, that would be like almost a declaration of war, um, which means that Israel has to prepare. Now, I don't think that an Israeli strike against Iran is imminent. I don't think we are right. yet there, but we have to build up that capability. And, and, and what happened was going back again to 2018, and with this, I'll, I'll stop for a moment, is, uh, is 2018, America pulls out of the deal. I'm sorry, I'm going to go back more in time. In 2015, when the deal happened, so Israel said, okay, there's a deal. It's a bad deal. We don't like this deal, but we're not going to attack now. There's a deal in place, and it's good for the next 15 years, right? Until the, what was known as the Sunset Clause kicks in, and then the Iranians can basically do whatever they want under the JCPOA. But we have 15 years of, of, of shekin, of quiet in Israel. Uh, so all the plans that had been put in place and were 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 ripe and were ready. We saw the the, del the deliberations in 2010 and 2012 of possibly attacking Iran. Israel had viable military options on the table, so they started to push those aside and reallocate resources and do different things because they didn't have. They now had 15 years, but then comes 2018. Trump pulls out of the deal. Now, what should happen is Israel should start to re-up its military plans, should start to get them ready again, but Israel didn't do that. And I think that that was a, uh, possibly a mistake, but it, 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 did, it, you know, it's a, it was a mistake that can be fixed. And I think that now what we're, what we're seeing ourselves in is this period of time 
that Israel is increasing its intelligence gathering in Iran. Israel is, is preparing its military. Israel is allocated, the government has allocated about 300 million shekel just for that purpose right now is kind of, of a quick Band-Aid. Um, but we're also waiting to see what's going to happen with these diplomatic overtures that the Americans are making to the Iranians. And, and I think anyone's best guess right now is no one really knows what's going to happen. Right. So you just said a mouthful, but I, <laughs> but, but I, but I hear what you're saying. Um, in, re in response to one of the points you made that you don't believe uh, an Israeli attack might be imminent, that 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 makes a lot of sense. Uh, at the same time, you know, I, I think it was in August that uh, Defense Minister Benny Gantz had said he does not rule out the possibility that Israel will have to take action in the future to prevent the nuclear Iran. I think just this week, Lapid said in Washington um, that other options are going to be on the table if diplomacy fails. Um, right. so, so, so what are these these other options? Does other option mean an, an Israeli attack or are or, is, is that a code for, for something else here? Well, um, unless there's something that, uh, some magical solution that I, I don't know about, which I don't think there necessarily is, uh, that, that, that's language for a military option. I think that what Israel's trying to do right now is, is very carefully walk this tightrope of, on the one hand, making a threat that seems genuine and credible, Right. And at the same time, not doing something that would upend the American and European diplomatic efforts. Israel doesn't want to be perceived as uh, undermining those diplomatic efforts. But at the same time, it does want to present a credible military threat and put it on the table. And I think, you know, it's important to point out is that while Israel was against the JCPOA, it wasn't against a diplomatic resolution to this problem. Israel still and has always believed that this is an international threat and challenge and that it requires a diplomatic solution. And not every solution is through military means, right? Israel used military means to destroy Saddam Hussein's nuclear reactor that was being built out in, it was called OC Rak outside of Baghdad in 1981. And Israel's military successfully destroyed the Al Kibar reactor that Syria, Bashar al Assad, was building in northeastern Syria in a place called Deir Azur back in 2007. Uh, so Israel has used military means, but in this case, because of the nature of the threat, because of how dispersed Iran's facilities are, because of how large these, these facilities are, how many there are and fortified they are, um, this is a much far greater military challenge for the state of Israel. Not that it can't be done, but not with necessarily the same uh, guarantee of success. And, and therefore, Israel has always argued that this requires a, an international effort and a diplomatic solution. The, the, so what happened, back, if I take you back in time, Israel was threatening back in 2010, 11, 12, and even 13 that it would use military means. And I think the world became very concerned that that was going to happen. They did not want that war. And that's what was the motivation for the P5 plus one, the world superpowers, to come together, to sit down in Vienna and to iron out a deal with the Iranians. So the, 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 the Israeli military threat is what helped get everyone to the table. Now, Israel would like to see that happen today, but it wants to see a better, a stronger and a longer deal that would be in place. Uh, so I think that's what it's doing, but it also doesn't want to be seen as someone who's just trying to undermine with unnecessary threats and saber rattling here in the region against the Iranians. But, but let me just add to that is, is, is the fact that Israel has long argued, and America has never really done this, I think, in the right way, that if America were to present a credible military threat of its own, that itself could potentially get the Iranians to recalculate, right? Now, the Iranians are not stupid. They look around and, and they say, OK, what, what price could we potentially pay? Now, let's look at what's happening right now in the Middle East. Right? The Biden administration has basically decided, and, and I don't mean this necessarily as a criticism of the Biden administration, but these are just the facts of what's happening. They've decided that they want to roll back their presence in the Middle East. They've pulled out of Afghanistan. There's talk of them pulling out of uh, Syria. They're, they're playing a, less of a role today in the Middle East. By the way, this happened also under Trump. right? And, and and the, the, the result of this is that if you're the Iranians and you see all this happening, 
you say to yourself, look, the Americans don't have an appetite right now for a military adventure that would take them to attack us. And therefore, we probably have a safe bet that we can continue with our program without any real risk of military inter intervention or an attack by Washington. Israel is a different question, right? Now, if on the other hand, imagine for a moment that the Americans said, you know, even Trump, go back in time, and I've heard Israeli officials say this as criticism of the way Trump did things back in 2018. But imagine if Trump, after pulling out of the deal, had taken 100 F-35s and F-22 Raptors and F-15s and flown them over Iran. They didn't do anything, just flying over Iran. Imagine what that would have done to the Iranians. And, you know, Bogi Alon, who was the former defense minister in Israel and former chief of staff, once he always used this one example. If you go back to 2003, right, uh, so, you know, America invades Afghanistan after the 9-11 uh, terror attacks. And then 2003 goes into Iraq. And if you look at the America in 2007, put out what was known as the NIE, the National Intelligence Estimate, which was like the, the, the intelligence community came together with its estimate about Iran's nuclear program. And, and, and they, they agreed and they concluded that in 2003, the Iranians suspended their nuclear program. Israel and America had an argument. Israel said that in 2005, they renewed their military program. America said they didn't, and that was where there was this disagreement between Israeli intelligence and American intelligence. But why did they suspend in 2003? There, everyone agreed. Why? Because they saw America go into Iraq. They were already in Afghanistan. And the Ayatollahs in Iran said to themselves, we're next. Right? We better stop. So when they saw a credible threat, they recalculated. The most important thing to them is the survival of their regime. Right? They want to stay in power. And, and, and I think that until now, we still have never really seen America present a credible and genuine military threat to the Iranians. And, 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 and without that, it's going to be very difficult to get them to agree to a deal that's going to guarantee and safeguard Israel's genuine concerns of what would happen if the Iranians continue on this current track. Right. You had recently written in a, in a recent op-ed in the Jerusalem Post um, about this and that Netanyahu's strategy to convince former President Trump uh, to withdraw from the JCPOA had actually failed. I, I believe you used the word failed. Is, is this the, the reason uh, what, what you're re referring to here or, is, is there, or can you elaborate on that to the members of our audience? Well, I, I think the reason is, is, is basically kind of most of what I was just saying, but it's, it's the fact that they withdrew, but there was no other plan in place, right? And, and so what happened was from 2018, and now we're at the end of 2021, nothing dramatic has changed except for one big thing, is that the Iranians have made some significant progress, right? So there was no new diplomatic resolution. There was no Israel neglected and put aside its military option. The Americans obviously are not interested in a military option of their own. So, in, so while the deal was, and again, it was a bad deal, right? And, and, and you, you know, by the way, you know how, you know how when, you know when something's a bad deal? Is when everyone in Israel from the left and the right agree that it's a bad deal, right? This is something that I think a lot of people tend to overlook is that you had back in 2015, when this deal was signed, you had the left wing, the labor party, you had the right wing, the Likud, and, and, and then it was the Jewish home. Every party across the board in the Israeli parliament, which never, who never agree on anything, right? Uh, <laughs> we're all in agreement that this deal was a bad deal. Uh, so if you're able to unite the Israeli parliament on something, then that, that, that must mean that something is really, is really a serious issue. Um, but, but kidding aside for a moment, the, uh, the, 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 the reason it failed was because nothing was put in place. Nothing progressed or advanced on the side of Israel, the United States, the P5 plus one, but the Iranians advanced. They were able to use the time to develop and manufacture more sophisticated and, and advanced centrifuges. They were able to accumulate more uh, enriched material and enriched uranium. And they were also able to make progress, we assume at least, with the weapons program, right? And, and, and maybe not in, in, in physical sense, but definitely in technical and scientific sense and doing the work and the research 
in the designs for the day that they were, they would decide to break out and to begin to build a bomb. So they used the time smartly to reinforce their facilities, um, but the world did not. And, and I think that's why we essentially, th that's why I called it a failure was because it, it, was, it was a good idea in, in, in the sense of, yes, this is a bad deal, let's get a better deal, but nothing, nothing really happened, nothing filled that vacuum. Um, and, and I think, by the way, Daniel, you know, uh, in, a, in, a, in a larger sense of things here in the Middle East, it's important to keep in mind that vacuums that are created in the Middle East never get filled by moderate elements or by good people or good guys. You, know, you just look, look throughout modern history here. Israel uh, pulls out of uh, Lebanon in 19, uh, in, in, sorry, in 2000. Six years later, we have the Second Lebanon War. And, and, and rather, just look what's happening on the streets of Lebanon today, right? I'm sure you're following the news. Hezbollah's marching out there. They're, they're shooting at Lebanese armed forces. The country's a mess. And they have about 100,000 rockets that threaten us, right? Israel pulls out of Gaza in 2005. What do we get? Hamas, right? America pulls out of Afghanistan just a couple months ago. Taliban take over like that, right? When, when, when Mubarak fell in the Tahrir Square, uh, um, rebellion or revolt back in 2011, the Muslim Brotherhood took over. Thankfully, they, Morsi was, was toppled by, uh, by, by President Sisi today. But look at Libya. Look at these countries. It, it just it doesn't happen. So this idea that you just pull out of the deal and, and, and that'll solve itself, it doesn't work that way. Right. Right. I, I don't know if... if if we uh, address this fully, um, but what would we say if the White House does decide now to rejoin the JCPOA in the coming months? What, what are the options for, for Israel, obviously? Well, look, if they go back just straight into the JCPOA without any real changes, um, again, I, I don't think it would see, Israel's military option would again fall to the side at least for the period of the deal. Israel is not going to attack while a deal is in place as long as the Iranians adhere to the deal. What Israel would like to see is that the Iranians, is, I'm sorry, is that the deal is, is a better deal. So what, what, what they would like to see is A, that it's, it's longer in time without the sunset clause, right? That, that, is, that, that they get rid of. And they'd also like to see that it's a stronger deal, right? So what, what does that mean by stronger? Is that it, it, it puts in place um, elements that would further restrict Iran's ability to enrich uranium, to develop uh, more sophisticated and advanced centrifuges, but would also like to see the ballistic missile program taken into account, right? No one talks about that. That was, that was totally ignored in the JCPOA. So they have already today thousands of missiles, about a thousand, let's say, that have the ability to reach Israel. In, a, in, in, in five years' time, they'll have 2,000. Right. And in 10 years time, we'll have 3000. So uh, we, we also have to do something about that. And that's something that's completely ignored. And, and in addition, Israel would like to see that their regional activities, primarily, primarily their support of Hezbollah, their support of Islamic Jihad and Hamas, what's happening with the Houthis in Yemen, their intervention in Iraq, uh, the way they're trying to establish bases and entrenchment in efforts in Syria. Israel would like to see some of that taken into account also in the deal. Now, I don't think we, we're going to get everything, right? I think that, for example, regional ambitions, Israel would say, okay, fine, you know, and we understand that can't be incorporated in the deal, but definitely the timeline and the ballistic missile has to be in there, right? So, so Israel, now what the Americans have said, which, which Israelis have uh, argued is, is, is wrong, is the, Amer the administration has said is, look, let's get back into the deal. And then we'll negotiate a longer and strong, a stronger deal. So Israel has made the argument, as, as have many people in, in the United States, is that what leverage would you use to get a longer and stronger deal if you've just gone back into the deal? Right? No, you don't go back into the deal. First, you would negotiate a longer and stronger deal, and then you go back into the deal, right? Because if you've gone back into the deal and removed and lifted sanctions, you lose any leverage you have over the Iranians. Uh, look. It, this is a complicated issue, and, and the Iranians have toyed with the West for decades on this, right? This is not something that's happened, you know, just in the last couple of years. 
the Iranians started their nuclear program a long time ago. You know, it was originally under the, the, the era of the Shah, when, uh, who was, by the way, a friend of Israel and a friend of the United States, and they wanted to create nuclear power for energy purposes. Um, under the Ayatollahs, first it was, it was neglected, and then they realized that this could help them create more regional hegemony and become a regional superpower. Uh, so they, they kicked a lot of money into it and, and, and with Russian support and, and some Pakistani support. Just this past week, A.Q. Khan, who was basically the, the father of Pakistan's nuclear weapon, passed away. I think it was cancer, but he was very instrumental in helping the Iranians build their first centrifuges back in the 90s and, and build up these, this capability that today they use to enrich uranium. So you know, th they have been doing this for, for over, I would say, at least in a military level, for over 30 years. Um, and uh, it, it's been a problem that I think we're going to still have to deal with for a while. But the, the question that Israel does have to grapple with is, and this is where it gets complicated, is at what point do you say, okay, it's all, it's not going to work. And we don't, we're, we're left with our last resort, which is a military option. Um, I don't think we're there yet, but but you know circumstances could change, and that would require Israel to take action potentially at one point. And 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 uh, listen, that 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 would be a very uh, I, I don't want to say scary scenario because I don't know that we need to be scared necessarily, but it would be a very difficult scenario because it will be a very difficult mission. And it would also lead, I think, to a large-scale conflict, the likes of which we have not really seen here in Israel ever. I understand. I understand. Um, I, I want to ask a question now geared towards some of uh, our students uh, that are in the audience. Um, obviously, you know, as a campus organization here at Hasbara, uh, you know, we're very concerned with the use of the demonization of Israel on campus, uh, which incessantly targets Jewish students on campus. And obviously on college university campuses, we are seeing Israel overwhelmingly discussed only in the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, so one of the reasons we always discuss Iran and why on our um, Hasbara fellowship pro programs to Israel, we always visit the borders of Syria and Lebanon. Um, so we want to exposed to students and help students understand that Israel is surrounded by terror proxies through Iran and surrounded by enemies on all sides. And to portray Israel as, you know, as, as the oppressor, um, you know, simply ignores the bigger picture. Um, in, in this context, what advice would you have for our students who want to discuss the Iranian threat on campus and educate other students, uh, you know, about the realities, uh, you know, regarding Iran and, and its terror proxies? Look, I think one of the problems that a lot of people um, fail to recognize is that Iran is not an Israeli problem, right? Iran is a problem for the entire world. And, you know, Israel, yes, talks about it a lot. And uh, the reason is, is because we're the ones who constantly are being threatened by the Iranians. We're the ones who the Iranians say they want to wipe off the map. We're the ones who just today, the, the today or yesterday, the Iranians threatened Israel you know, with, with annihilation, if we keep up our so-called military adventures. Um, so that, that ought, and the fact that the Iranians are actively supporting terrorists, like you mentioned, in Syria, right. Lebanon, and Gaza, who are almost daily trying to attack us. So, uh, so that's what puts us at the forefront. But, but this is really an issue that is on such a larger scale and a global level. And, it, and let, me, let me just give you two, two reasons why, right? The first is um, a nuclear Iran on the one hand, yes, would pre present an existential threat to the state of Israel, because if they have a nuclear weapon, they could potentially use it against us. And Israel's a small country, right? And, and, and the thought that a nuclear weapon could fall in the Gush Dan Tel Aviv area, where hundreds of thousands of people, if not more, could be killed, it does not mean necessarily the end of the state of Israel, but, but it, it, it would be close, right? Um, so that, that definitely has the potential to be an existential threat. But what also a nuclear Iran would do is it would set off a nuclear arms race in this region that would turn the Middle East, which is already so volatile, into a nightmare, right? right? You have countries that feel no less threatened by Iran than Israel. You know, people have to ask themselves, 
and 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 it always amazes me how people ignore this is just take a look at the meeting you mentioned Lapid's visit to Washington. So Lapid's sitting in the State Department. He's at one table. Lincoln's at another table, and Prince Ab and, and Sheikh Abdallah's at the third table, and they're all talking about Iran together, right? The, the Emiratis, the Bahrainis, the Saudis are no less threatened and fear, fearful of Iran than Israel, if not more. Now, if, if someone was, was, was honest with themselves, they would wonder, how is it possible that so many Arabs, millions of Arabs, are concerned about Iran and agree completely with Israel, with the Jews on this issue? How is that possible if, if, we're, if we're all supposed to be enemies with one another? How does that make sense? Because Iran is not just a threat to Israel, it is a global problem. It's a problem for those countries as much as it is a problem for us. And I think that that's, that's important. And, and there's no shortage of comments by the leaders of countries in the Gulf sharing and expressing their concern for what would happen if there'd be a nuclear Iran. But you would have the Saudis would go after a weapon. The Egyptians would go after a weapon. Uh, maybe the, the Turks would definitely go after a weapon. And you would have a, a very very uh, nightmarish scenario here in, in the Middle East if that were to happen. The, the, yeah. the second issue is, and I think is important, is what type of world are we looking to create, right? We're, we're, what values are we looking to, to spread and to share with the world, right? And, and, I, and I think that, you know, if we look at the values that Israel stands for, which are the, the liberty, freedom, equality, Right. And I think that, of course, these people who are going to be attacking Israel, they, they don't see it the same way. But and then we look at the values that are being spread by the Iranians were just the other day, the Basij, which, are, which is this, this group of Iranian thugs. Right. Which are kind of like this secret police shot at a group of five women who were just riding their bikes in, in Iran. Right. This is another Taliban like state. Is that what we want to see? Is that what we want to see spread? throughout the world and throughout the region, those types of values. And I think that if they get those nuclear weapons, they'll have a greater ability to undermine more moderate regimes and to spread this radical extreme ideology throughout the region and even beyond. So, so this is a problem that really transcends just the, the typical Israel-Arab conflict. This is far greater. Right. That, that's an excellent question. Th thank you, Yaakov. Um, I, I see it's actually 1.40 1 and uh, we have several students who actually want to ask you a, uh, a couple of questions and keep the conversation sure. going. Uh, so I'm actually going to call upon our uh, wonderful Hasbara US director, Ali Levine, um, who is going to be handling Q&A. And I feel like I'm frozen. Can you hear me? <laughs> we hear I hear you. you are frozen, yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, wonderful. The, I, on my screen, I'm frozen. So, Ellie, this is the perfect time to bring you in. Thank you so much. And well, thanks for all your, your comments uh, so far. And it's always uh, illuminating uh, to hear you speak, whether in person or on Zoom. Uh, so thank you again. And, and um, we'll, we'll take it to, uh, we'll keep going with the Q&A here. And uh, we have, uh, is Evan ready? Evan, are you ready to turn on your camera and ask your question? Hey, what's up? I'm ready. And if we could ask all the students, just introduce yourself and your campus. And, uh, and fire away. Go ahead, Evan. Um, awesome. Um, so my name is Evan. I'm currently a student at Rutgers University, or rising. I am a senior, actually. Um, the situation at Rutgers is actually um, not as bad as, 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 as people would think, but we're still definitely keeping an eye of, of what's going on. Um, so the question I um, wanted to know is, I know that there's you know, still sort of widespread bipartisan support for Israel among both, uh, both parties. Uh, it's, when it comes to the JCPOA agreement, I know that there's you know, some, a little bit more division. Um, do you foresee the Biden administration possibly implementing or pushing through this policy uh, given the political pressures from some in his party and then also given the fact that it was something championed by the Obama administration in 2008 and 2012 and something that um, Biden said he wanted to get back into uh, while he was running for office. You know, the uh, I, I think that definitely Biden would like to see some sort of resolution to this issue with the Iranians, right? His 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 objective is to just get this off his plate, right? This is not what he wants to be focused on. This is not where he wants to be investing his political capital. 
he would much rather be pushing through his infrastructure bill. He would much rather be getting things done in the fight against COVID. There are other issues that are form, far more important for the Democratic Party right now than the Middle East, right? Um, you see that even with the with talk about the Palestinians, right? This is not a top priority for them, which is very different than previous Democratic administrations. Look at Obama, look at Clinton as examples, right? Um, by the way, it, it's, it's much different than even the Trump administration, which was very focused on the Israeli-Palestinian issue, not necessarily in a way that the Palestinians liked, but it was trying to move things forward. It had its peace to prosperity plan that they worked very hard and put together. Uh, and it's an interesting read if you ever want to go back and look at it. But uh, and also, of course, the Bush administration, George W. Bush with his roadmap and the Annapolis conference. And, and, and they tried numerous times to, to restart the Israeli-Palestinian peace talks. So the, the Biden administration, I think, is just very uh, hesitant to, to, to get overly involved or too deeply involved here in the Middle East. Uh, it could be that maybe they've seen that there's just no true benefit that comes of it. Maybe they don't really believe in a, in a, in a, in a solution to this conflict right now. I think that they also see that the players at the top in Israel, whether it's Naftali Bennett and Yair Lapid and, and this government that we have right now in place, is not going to be capable of making the necessary concessions to reach a deal with the Palestinians. And also Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas is, is, is in his mid-80s, if not already 86, I think, maybe, or even older. Um, and uh, he's, not, you know, he's been saying no for decades. Why would he suddenly say yes now? So that's on the Palestinians. But overall, I think it just speaks to their lack of interest in the Middle East, including Iran. So I think they want to see the JCPOA go through. Remember, Biden was also the vice president of Obama. He was there. When, when Obama pushed through the, the, the JCPOA back in 2015. He would like that to happen again now as well. Uh, and, and just get this off his plate and not have to deal with it, right? Um, but that's not a proper, I think, strategy, right? You don't just hope that something goes away and it goes away. It doesn't just go away. These things tend to fester and they become a bigger problem and a bigger threat and a greater challenge. And that's what we're seeing right now with Iran. Uh, I think, again, you know, getting back to just something I said before, it's very interesting that you have the Gulf states standing together with Israel on this issue and are really trying to push the Americans to take a tougher stance. You know, we heard Blinken yesterday make a comment that I, that I say might be the first time where he basically said, look, you know, the, the window for them to return to the deal is closing. And, and we're going to have to start thinking about other options as well. That's interesting to start to hear from the Americans. Uh, it's a recognition that that just a return to the JCPOA is not going to be as simple as they thought it would, would be. By the way, that also has to do with the fact that there's a new president in Iran, uh, Raisi, who took over just a couple months ago, far more radical than Rouhani, who was the outgoing, the former president. Um, you know, while he doesn't call the shots, he still have the supreme leader, Khamenei, but he definitely has, carries a lot of sway in, in, in helping to settle, set policy um, uh, this guy's not a good guy. So, you know, the, the fact is that they're not, the Iranians are not rushing um, and the Americans don't have a lot of leverage right now over the Iranians when it comes to that. Thank you for that, uh, Yaakov. And uh, we have uh, a few more questions lined up here. And if anyone wants to ask a question, if you just click on participants on the bottom and then you'll see a raise hand uh, button and icon, please feel free to do so. And if you'd like me to just ask your question, you can just put it in the group chat. And uh, and uh, we have, uh, I see three hands up at the moment. We'll call on them. And Yaakov, we have about 15 minutes left. And whenever we have you or any of your J-Post colleagues, we run out of time for all the questions. So maybe you want to go rapid fire here uh, with, uh, with the- Go ahead. If, you have time. And if we run out, it'll have to be till next time. But uh, but I see, uh, I see Taylor, uh, if you'd like to just introduce yourself and your school, Taylor, and- uh, Go ahead. Hi, yeah, I'm Taylor. I go to York University in Toronto. Um, first, thank you for sharing your expertise with us. It's greatly appreciated and really interesting to hear from someone like yourself. I was thank wondering you. what role, if any, does Canada play in all of this? I know that Canada and Iran have had really rocky relationships in the past and Canada isn't as involved as the U.S. is, but I was wondering if there are any implications or ramifications of Canada being an ally of the U.S. and also of Israel. Look, I mean, it's a great question, Taylor, and thank you. I've been to York University. It's a great. It's a. It's a nice school. Um, 
I think that, uh, first of all, you know, Canada is definitely a friend of Israel. And um, the Trudeau government, you know, the, yes, they don't necessarily see eye to eye on a lot of issues, uh, but but has always uh, stood with Israel, I think, on, on, on when it's come to key challenges and whether it was on anti-Semitism um, and uh, calling out the, uh, the singling out and the demonization of Israel in international forums. Um, and Canada is also a member of NATO, right? So they do carry sway there and have influence over these international organizations. I don't think that anyone would expect Canada to take any military action or to play a greater role in that sense. But I think like all countries, what's important here is, is that people are very clear and, and, and unequivocal in what needs to happen and who is right and who is wrong. And, and that's where Canada could play a role, right? And that's where all countries can play a role is making it clear what needs to happen? What is a right and legitimate resolution to this conflict or to this threat with the Iranians? And, and how Israel is on the right and, and, and it's not the other way around. And that's important for people to hear. You know, like if you're facing a, a challenge on campus of where people are saying, well, you know, Israel is, is the aggressor. Israel is, 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 is the one who's creating uh, the, the, is hostile. Israel is the one who's stoking the flames of this conflict. And there's no one on the Canadian government side who's willing to say, no, that's not the case. We need to be clear of what's really happening. Then that's, that, that, that's a problem, right? So I think that that's what we need to always demand of our leaders. It's not always going to be send an F-16. It's not always going to be, you know, uh, something at the United Nations Security Council table. It's even just being, having moral clarity on what is right and what is wrong. Let's go to Kobe. And Kobe, go ahead. If you want to introduce yourself in school. And Hey, how's it going? My name is Kobe Ackerman. First of all, I just wanted to thank all the amazing advisors over here, the donors, and thank you specifically you, Yako, for coming and giving us your time. Most appreciated, as uh, my friend Taylor said. Um, I just had a quick question. Uh, it could be uh, loaded, but I'll try to not make it as loaded. Let's, uh, let's talk 10, 15 years in advance. Um, pretend like there's uh, let's say there's like a ripple effect if israel somehow has to go into iran what's going to happen with let's say russia china i mean israel already is a little bit entrenched in iran with the mossad uh some of us are familiar with the uh, what is it apple uh i forgot the apple tv show called tehran you know they're already in iran whatever um so would china and russia maybe get on the ground in israel and even something crazier than that North Korea, who they have no value for anything, they can just shoot away? Like, what do you think about that? I don't think we have to worry about North Korea here in Israel. I think the pro North Korea plays a dangerous role in proliferation of nuclear technology. It was the North Koreans, for example, who helped the Syrians build their nuclear reactor back in two, that was destroyed by Israel in 2007, right? So North Korea has helped uh, the Syrians build their Scud missiles. North Korea has helped Iraq. So, so they, they, that, that's where, and Iran as well. So that's where they play a dangerous role. It's that axis and that relationship between those different countries. I don't think we have to worry necessarily of them firing intercontinental ballistic missiles towards Israel, although, listen, anything's possible. But that, 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 that's, something, that's not something that we need to, I think, be concerned about. And China and Russia, you know, they might not say it in the same way, but trust me, they're just as concerned about an Iran that becoming nuclear. Uh, Iran does sit to the south of Russia, uh, in, in, in a radicalized Muslim minority in Russia could spell trouble for the for Moscow and for the Kremlin. They would not want that to happen. We've seen their challenges in Chechnya. Uh, so, you know, it, it, they, everyone has their issues. But again, they also have strong economic ties. They've been a patron of the Iranians. So have the Chinese. I wouldn't worry about them attacking Israel, God forbid. That's not something that I would worry about. And if that were to happen, I think we find ourselves in some really nightmarish scenario of a world war of sorts. But uh, but they, they're going to worry about, first and foremost, their own personal interests, which is economic, trade, gas and oil deliveries, um, and, and, and presenting a opposition to the United States and to the West and using Iran as a tool to do that. So that, that's a lot of what I think we're seeing happening. But that seeing a conflict of that scale is not something I think we need to be worried about right now.
Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Yaakov. And I'm going to try to combine a couple of the questions we have in the chat here, uh, which uh, one of them is about, well, related to your book, uh, Shadow Strike, uh, which uh, is fantastic. I'd recommend to everybody. And actually, last time we had you, it was specifically about your book, which is about uh, when Israel attacked Syria's nuclear reactor and, and eliminated it in 2007. And, and one of the questions we have here is, other than the geography that Iran is farther from Israel, how is the Iranian situation different from, from Syria if Israel needed to take a, uh, a military approach to eliminate the nuclear, the nuclear program there? And, and the other question we have, which we'll, we'll combine here, is from, from Nathan, uh, representing our high school interns. Thank you, Nathan. Which is, he's just asked, would Israel do it? Could Israel uh, take uh, military action against Iran without foreign support, U.S. support, or, or other allies support? So first of all, the reason it's different is because A, it's farther away. Uh, Syria was, you know, just about, the Syrian reactor was just about 600 kilometers away, which is also a distance, but, but, but nothing to scale. Iran is about double that distance. So that's number one. So any, any, anytime you're operating farther from your homeland is going to be complicated in case something goes wrong. Remember, we don't have aircraft carriers that we could send out to the Persian Gulf for our aircraft to, to, to get refueled or to land if there's a problem. Uh, we have one aircraft carrier, it's called the State of Israel. It doesn't really move, right? So you, 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 you need, your, your planes can only take off here and they would need to land here unless you maybe, you know, you get the Saudis to agree to something secretive or, you know, America and Iraq bases, which I don't know if that would happen. And that's been a lot of speculation about things like that potentially, but it's farther. As compared to Syria and Iraq, that we were both talking about one single facility above ground. And in both cases, when that single facility was destroyed, you essentially destroyed their nuclear program. Here in Iran, we're talking about at least a dozen facilities spread out throughout the country, and some of them underground. Take the Natanz facility, which is their main enrichment facility where they have their centrifuges, they enrich uranium. Uh, it's, it's, it's buried underground but beneath steel and reinforced concrete. A, a conventional military strike doesn't work here. So if it's against serious reactor, you get about six aircraft. That's all it took to take it out. Here, you would require dozens, if not hundreds, of aircraft involved in such an operation. You know, I mean, just to give you a sense for one second, Ellie, in, in, in the last operation in Gaza, actually tonight, I spoke with a pilot in the Air Force who flew, if you remember, Israel destroyed in, in during Guardian of the Walls, which, yes, is a terrible name for an operation, I know. But in, during that operation, um, Israel, uh, one, in, on a Thursday night, Israel flew into Gaza and destroyed this network of underground tunnels, right? They, they gave it this terrible name called Metro, which we've talked about, by the way, thinking about Hasbara. You don't call your enemy's underground terror tunnel network Metro because people around the world will hear Metro and they'll be like, oh, I didn't know that the people of Gaza have an underground subway like in New York City, right? Uh, it, you, don't, you, you call it what it is, an underground terror tunnel network. That's what they destroyed. Yeah. But some, some, someone in the army, and I said this actually, the idea of spokesman at the time, I'm like, what is wrong with you guys? But anyhow, uh, you know how many aircraft participated in that attack? And this is just Gaza, 150 fighter jets wow. in wave after wave after wave. And that's in Gaza. So imagine what you would require in Iran. Now, despite all of that, and this gets to um, the second question, is Nathan, I think it was, right, is that uh, um, Israel can do it. I think that Israel does have enough capability, and this is what I hear, you know, what do I know, but I hear this from the military experts, is that Israel does have the military capability to attack some of these key facilities to cause enough damage to set them back. Can Israel destroy Iran's nuclear program for good? No. But by the way, keep in mind is that also in 1981, when Israel destroyed Iraq's nuclear reactor, everyone thought that it was just going to be suspended, just, but they never got it back. Right In 2007, Israel destroyed Syria's nuclear reactor. Syria could have tried to rebuild it. So there's always that chance. What you have to hope for is that with your military intervention, something else comes afterwards that prevents them from building it up. So that just underscores the importance of cooperation on an international level. Israel could always act alone, but if it doesn't have support of the United States, if it doesn't, if, if, if everyone's not aligned and on the same page, 
then you might just set them back, but it might just be for a couple of years and then they'll just rebuild things. Now, we might find ourselves at that point one day. We might find ourselves at the point that Iran is enriching uranium at military grade levels. They're building a bomb and America is standing by and doing nothing. And Israel will have to decide what it does. And, and maybe setting it back is going to be the best case scenario and is going to be worth the price we will pay in the war that will ensue with Hezbollah, with Hamas, and maybe with Iran and Syria. But, but it, in an ideal world, you want your military strike to receive, it, to have international legitimacy because you will need massive international intervention to ensure that they don't just build everything again. And that, that's what makes this all the more complicated. Nako, thank you. And, um, and fortunately, we're out of time for more questions. And, and I see Hannah and Tamar's hands were up. Please email them to us and we'll do our best to, to answer the questions. And I promise next leadership session, you're first, uh, Tamar and Hannah. Uh, which, uh, and, and with that, I'll actually, I'll just announce what we have coming up next. And Yaakov, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, it, My pleasure. It's always illuminating to, to hear from you. And uh, we hope we'll see you in person for Hasbara Fellowships in person. Uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing you guys and Ellie, Daniel, Robin, all you guys and all the students out there really keep up the amazing work. Um, you, you keep, you make Israel stronger and safer. And, and I know it's tough. Uh, trust me, I do. I, I've been to a lot of your campuses over the years, uh, and I've, I've had the opportunity or the privilege <laughs> to be heckled and screamed at. And, uh, and I, I, I can only, you know, I, I can only imagine what it's like today in, in such a hostile environment. And the fact that many of you take out not only your time to invest in, in, in promoting Israel, but to literally put your lives on the line and, and, to, and to be at the forefront to represent us and, and to stand for our country is, is admirable and, and really a huge thank you uh, from, from me to what you guys do. And, uh, and, and Ellie, for the people who had questions left, feel free to so give them my email, have them send it to me. I'll be happy to answer in the next couple of days, okay? Thank you so much for that, Yaakov. And so we'll, we'll take you up on that. And uh, for, for everyone, all the students, if you, if you have been with us to Israel, if you're a Hasbara fellow, uh, please let your peers know applications are open for December. Uh, there's still places left uh, for December 12th, December 19th, and December 26th. Three different groups going to Israel this winter, uh, and there are still some spots left. So have them apply uh, as soon as you can. Uh, and, uh, and, and it should work for almost every campus because we have different dates. So it should work with your winter breaks. Uh, and next leadership session will be November 4th. We have Shachar Azani, who we've had uh, in the past, and the topic is the new anti-Semitism. Uh, so join us on Zoom. That one will be six o'clock Eastern. So it'll be a little bit later in the day. Uh, and uh, so November 4th, you'll get the announcement. And for the community members on the line and, and our supporters, thank you so much for being here. It's, it's a great opportunity, these Zoom sessions, to have you together with the students. And you're the ones that make our work possible uh, through your time and your financial support. And so thank you for being here. Uh, and an, uh, another, just one more announcement, uh, especially for you, is, is our yearly fundraiser coming up November 16th, uh, which uh, where we have our donations doubled uh, like we do every year. Uh, so you may be getting a call from us at that time. And we appreciate you participating as always so that we can make Hasbro Fellowships possible. Uh, and so thank you for being here. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and I look forward to, uh, to being in touch and to continuing to do our work together, to standing up against anti-Semitism, standing up for Israel and uh, making the world and making our campuses a better place. And so thank you all. Thanks for joining us. See you next time. Well said, Ellie. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for moderating. And thanks, everybody, for being here. And Yaakov, thank you again.